Well, it's a welcome return after, we think, a couple of years for Lee Pomeroy, who's come to talk to us about the Red Planet and the English Rock Ensemble. So, welcome, Lee. Ah, oh, thanks, Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Mark. Nice to hear from you. Great to hear from you. So, there seems to be a lot of excitement around this album. Do you feel that this album is a return to form for Rick? Uh, yeah, I think so. It, it, when Rick first uh, sort of discussed the album, which was maybe sort of back end of last year, and I said to him, you know, well, what you, you know, what sort of album is it? And he just said, prog. <laughs> he said, oh, right. He said, yeah, like full on prog. He said, all instrumental. He said, think, you know, just think about some of the early uh, stuff. He said, I'm kind of aiming at that sort of direction. So and I thought, oh, it's great because I love Six Wives. That's my favourite mm. album that Rick ever did. Because I used to look at the cover and read the cover, you know, and read all the gear and all, look at all the kind of equipment he had and stuff. So I thought, oh, man, if he's going back sort of to, to that sort of sound, then uh, I'm in. And, and he really has. He's, you know, he's using Hammond organ and he's using lots of Mellotron. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's you know, he's, he's doing all the things that will put a smile on the faces of people like me, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. But what I was wondering was I, was, I, I took a listen to the last English rock ensemble album out there from 2003 um oh God, yeah, how, back. yeah how how does it compare with that i mean one obvious thing is that this is a, an instrumental and that one had vocals on it yeah i mean they've, they've both got that space concept of course I, in some ways they're i think they're similar because of that kind of overarching thing of sort of space exploration but obviously that there are no instrumental tracks on that album at all and so you know, you've got less of the um, uh, solo, you know, solo explorations that are on the Red Planet. So yeah. Rick's kind of taking uh, solos uh, every tune. Also, I think with Out There, because you're writing for a, a lyricist, uh, sorry, you're writing for a singer to sing. Yeah. Um, I guess you have to be a little more careful with what you write because some things are going to be just far too tricky to sing. Yeah. With an in- <laughs> instrumental album, you can yeah. do what the hell you like. You can make it as um you know complex or you know you can do whatever you want to do so yeah like there's one track um which is the last track which is called valles marineris yeah and the intro uh, riff that kind of builds up over this military snare drum is in a, a group of five six and then seven eight so mm. you've got this kind of nice riff and then i kind of start following it on the bass and building a riff up over the top of it you know, so you can kind of maybe explore a few more areas like that without having to think, oh, how's he going to sit? How's the poor guy going to sing on this? You know, <laughs> uh, so so I think it, it's got similarities, you know, certainly mm. because like Rick's definitely going for that sort of once again, well, Rick always goes for that expansive theme. That's why I love his stuff mm. so much. But it, he can just really turn up the steam on the instrumentals and, and, and get the players to really play out on this one, which, yeah. you know, Dave Cole whose guitar playing is ridiculous on this album <laughs> and the sound is incredible ash Sohn, the drummer i mean Ash is an absolute legend anyway um yeah. and i had a great time too you know i was able to just get all of my guitars out because we kind of recorded this at the start of lockdown really yeah. so um I, I i'm in my little isolation inspiration station to quote uh bob mortimer the <laughs> english comedian and um I've got all my guitars around me. So I've got, you know, uh, three Fender Jazzies, a Fender Precision, and a Rickenbacker, pre Ernie Ball, Music Man Stingray, a five string Stingray, I've got a Chapman stick. Yeah. I've got uh, my Taurus pedals are here. I've got everything with me. So I, I just got it all out yeah. and just thought, right, and just lined them all up and said, okay, what do I want to play on this one? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's five different basses on eight tracks on this, because I thought, oh, yeah. great. Yeah. He's a, there's even a bit of fretless, in fact, on that last track, yeah. Valis Marineris. There's, and also a guest appearance from my son huh? uh, pl- playing bass pedals um, uh, on Valis Marineris. <laughs> uh, and he's he's credited on the uh, on the on the on the record. Uh, so uh, he's seventeen. So uh, that really made his seventeenth wow. birthday. Yeah, I bet it did. Yeah. So um, originally, my question was was going to be what the inspiration was for this record. Now, obviously, it's Mars. Obviously, since it's the Red Planet. But what I was more yeah. curious about was uh, is Rick one of these followers like me of these NASA channels where they show all these live feeds from the from the Mars rover and stuff like that? Is that what what the inspiration was for this record? 
Richard? I mean, Rick would probably be able to share a bit more light on that, but Rick's always had a really keen interest in space, and he knows a lot about it as well. He knows a lot about the subject. And also, a good friend of Rick is Brian May. Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, and, yeah. and so they kind of chat, and, you know, Rick's always had a keen interest in that, uh, in, in the subjects of space and exploration of space, etc. Uh, I mean, going back right to the 70s uh, since... Um, uh, what's the album called? No Earthly Connection. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, he's he's always been interested in it. And um, the, the album that we did in 2003, that had a space theme. So he's mm. always kind of got an ear to that. And I guess that subject matter allows you to be as big as you want, mm. you know, because if you're writing about the infinite, the, the infinity of space, then you can make a song as grand, as grandiose as you as you want to. Obviously, with that in mind, and with his vast knowledge of space, you know, he could have thought of, you know, Saturn or Jupiter. I mean, that's why I was kind of always curious about if the whole Mars rover, uh, you know, thing was kind of the thing that made him well, inspired to it. Because there is quite a lot of it out there to see. Mm, mm. There is, but but I think also it's the, the idea that, you know, if you listen to any scientists when they talk about Mars, you know, that they're, they're saying mm. that that's the place we could go to next. Mm. First yeah. back for, via the moon, obviously, because it's back to the moon first and then on to Mars. So yeah. with Saturn, with Jupiter, you can't land on them because they're gas giants. You'd just be <laughs> yeah. immediately crushed, you know. But but because Mars is smaller than the Earth, so I think it's got a less gravitational pull than the Earth. It's it's kind of it's more habitable potentially yeah. for humans to land on. Yeah. Uh, you can't go to Venus because it's far too hot. Mercury's <laughs> boiling hot on one side and freezing cold on the other, so you can't go there. Yeah. So the only one is is Mars, and I guess that idea of humans looking toward Mars in the future, if if we manage to completely knacker this planet, which we're doing a, a fine job of so mm. far, mm. Yeah. you know, then Mars is the is the next place we're going to go to. So I suppose it's always the the, the obvious choice, really, to to write about. But I think also because we know more about it than yeah. all the other planets. Yeah, tying in with the space theme there was supposed to be a playback of the new album at the national space center not far from me in in leicester that's a great shame that yeah. had to be cancelled real real shame i was going to go um I, th- I think ash was going to go and dave Cahoon was going to go i think we were all going to show up and i was really looking forward to it because i've never been there mm. I've mm. never been to that. Um, uh, what's it called again? It's called National the, Space um, Centre. That's it. I've never been to the National Space Centre, which is shocking, really. I should go, but mm. um, but that was my excuse. I thought, fantastic, I'm actually going to get to see it. Yeah. And and I feel for Rick, too, because I think that the album would have come out earlier, but obviously, you know, timing, lockdown, etc., has kind of halted everything. So um, Rick, Rick was really looking forward to doing a big launch of this album, um, you know, plenty of press and, and really sort of getting people interested and vibed up about it. But it's it's just come to a, a dead stop. Yeah. However, mm. it's still a great album. And at the end of the day, if the music kind of isn't good enough, then no matter what kind of press you do, if, if you're getting bad reviews because the, the, the music isn't great, then <laughs> it doesn't matter. But this is a real cracking uh, album. It, yeah. it really is really um, hits you right between the eyes, this one. Which of these songs did you feel was the most challenging for you to play? There were a few, actually. One of the ones that was a challenge in terms of just working out a riff uh, was was the last track, Valis Marineris, because because of that intro rhythm um, being in 5-4, 6-4 and 7-4. And it had a very distinct rhythm between those three bars on this uh, drum, snare drum. Uh, and And so that was trying to work out something that went to, that played along exactly with that rhythm, but also kind of played underneath the chords that Rick was playing over the top, because Rick's playing kind of chords that change in different places, mm. not necessarily to the five, six, and seven. Right. So I was trying to work out a riff that would fit with both Rick's chords and would go along with this snare drum pattern. So that was kind of the that was my most head scratching one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, there was another riff on a track called I think it's Tharsis Tholus, yeah, where it's this really fast little and it's a kind of really weird little timing the way it occurs in the middle of a bar and sometimes you'll play it three or four times through, sometimes you'll play it once or twice and then at the end of the song it starts to uh, move in key so you're trying to play Mm. this little riff that's a really strange little timing and get it really nice and tight and then move it around the neck as well 
So um, that was a, a particularly head scratching bit. So I would, but I would say Valis Marinera is probably yeah. My, yeah. Fa- my, my favorite, if I've got, a, I don't know if you're going to sort of <laughs> cue that one up next, <laughs> but my favorite track is a track called Arcea Mons, which uh, is kind of a, a, it's quite a groovy little tune actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, and and I, I just I, had, I mean I had fun planning all of it, but that track in particular. Yeah, I think you can hear you can hear me smiling on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we've heard just a, a couple of of extracts. So you've you've already mentioned, I think, the two that we've heard on the on the little interviews series oh, right, that, yes. that Rick's done. Yeah. So Tharsis Follis, yeah. and that's got a, an amazing mini moog. I'm assuming it's mini moog's solo, and yeah. and the ones that you you just meant I can't pronounce it. Arisa Mons yeah. or whatever um, it is. Valis Marineris and Arcia Mons. Ah, right. And yeah. that's a real, as you say, high octane romp from the little bit that we've heard. But yeah. it's also yeah. got a lovely interlude on acoustic guitar. So that's right. Do you think that kind of variety and contrast is important in a prog album? Well, I think you know the the, the, the key thing with the word prog is that it's a shortening of progressive, isn't it? So. I think it's the idea that being progressive means you can, you know, all bets are on. You know, you can go anywhere you like. You can, you can say, right, well, this is the brass band section, <laughs> uh, and then yeah. and then this this goes into the mariachi section, and then out into the into the jazz swing bit. And you can do all that stuff <laughs> yeah. because no one's telling you that you can't. You know, and I think yeah, yeah. Also, if Rick, like like most of us, you know, we all have different tastes uh, in music. So, you know, you, you, if you were to do an album all in one style, you might not be as interested by it as if you think to yourself, well, you know, I really love rock music, but also like like listening to Chopin. So, you know, I'm going to put a lovely piano interlude in one of these songs. And I think yeah. Rick's, Rick's got so many interests in different types of music and, of course, grew up playing soul music and the pop covers of the day when he was sort of yes. a young guy. There's a lot of music in Rick. There's so much. So, uh, you know, uh, so I think he just can't help himself but want to explore all of those avenues, sometimes within one piece of music, in the same way that dear Steve Hackett, who, I've, you know, I've played yeah. for and love Steve dearly, he's the same. He has this kind of curiosity about all different types of music and he wants to explore them all. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm all for that. I'm all for art for art's sake. So I'm a big fan and follower of Rick Wakeman's, obviously. Uh, when he started these videos for The Red Planet, I was hoping for several making of videos. And so far, only you and Dave have provided some insight with that. Now, do you know if there will be any videos in the future about you know, the drumming from Ash, or even if Rick himself will be doing any uh, videos with him doing the recording of the keyboards? I mean, I think there there will be, and I, and I I also think that I think that there, there's due potentially an, uh, a DVD at some point, perhaps, yeah. uh, or with with extra stuff talking about the the making of uh, with with maybe with Rick. I'm not sure about Ash. Um, Ash is an inc- such a, an incredibly busy guy because Ash is like one of the top session drummers. Well, certainly in the UK, but, um, you know, he's really well known around the world. So he's constantly busy. He records a lot with Trevor Horn and he's recorded for Adele and, you know, Ed Sheeran and all sorts of people. So I'm not sure about Ash, but I think Rick will definitely be doing uh, or maybe even have done uh, more stuff. And I think that as and when, you know, everything is in a position to start moving again, you might see a bit more of that. And, you know, potentially there might be a DVD or an extra type of thing being released to, mm. that, that's got more in-depth interviews with everything you see. Yeah. I know that uh, you recorded these songs in isolation at home. Now, for us gear yeah. nerds at home, uh, what did you use for this recording? Did you go kind of DI and then use plugins, or did you use some sort of an amp modeler like a Kemper? Uh, both, actually. So oh. it, I've got a Kemper. Um, I've got two, in fact, that uh, that I bought when I was doing the Yes ARW tours. And so I set the Kemper quite often to my Yes setting and re- would record with that. Uh, on a track like Arcea Mons, I didn't do that. I actually went um, directly into my UAD Apollo for a different type of sound. I wanted a more kind of DI'd sound for that particular track. 
There was also some recording at Dave Colhoun's studio, this again before lockdown, yeah. um, just before lockdown. Uh, I went over to his studio and he had a lovely old vintage park amp, which is mm. uh, was, was made by the guys who were in Marshall. Right. And then kind of a couple of the guys broke away in the sort of late 60s, early 70s and made these park amps and they're fantastic. And I took a cab there and we mic'd my amp up through this park amp and with my bass speaker so there were three different ways of recording depending on the track i would sort of think to myself oh this 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 might be nice if we had a real amp you know or uh, you know i at the time lockdown came i thought okay i can't go to dave's now i had to do it all here so um for a while, the plan was to go to David's and record it all there. Mm-hmm. But, um, which would, you know, we did some recording together, which was great fun because then you can play around with the track. You can both kind of riff on ideas or come up with uh, a little riff you could play together. Or, you know, if he's got an arpeggio that's going down, I might play something that goes up to kind of get that opposing motion mm. type of thing. So we did uh, a little bit of that. But once lockdown hit, then I just came back home. Uh, and came into my little room and uh, and recorded it all here. Yeah, so that's how it was done. Combination of um, mic'd up amp, Kemper, and also uh, a couple of tracks DI'd into my uh, Apollo, UAD Apollo. Mm, wonderful stuff. Okay, so you've already said then you, you've been working out riffs and, and so on, but uh, how much did you actually end up adding to the songs musically? And and how were they presented to you? Did you just have all of Rick's parts already written and you added to them or what happened? I mean, Rick, he uh, would send, the first thing he would send was just audio. Uh, and Ash was the first to, to record. So Ash did all his drums first, which is great because for a bass player, you want to be playing to the actual drummer, yeah. you know, not to a click because the drummer can kind of speed up and slow down. Even though there's a click, they can kind of manipulate time with it just to kind of give something a bit more edge or make it feel a bit laid back. So the drums were done first uh, and a lot of Rick's guide keyboards were done first. Once Ash had done his, then I would get the files and I would start to put the bass down. Uh, now, Rick would also produce like scores for it, for all the stuff. Yeah, um, right. I'm not a very, very good reader of, of, of music. I'm very slow. Yeah. And so I almost would say that I don't really read music. So, but I can, if, because Rick sent the scores over, sometimes if there was a bit that was a bit tricky, I could look down his score, his piano score, and find the bass clef and just kind of work things out from that. Mm-hmm. So that was handy. Um, so there were, were, there were certain riffs that we had to play together, and you'll hear those on the, the album. But there were other times, and a lot of other times, where Rick said, it's up to you, come up with something, see what you want to do. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, there's, it, that's, it's brilliant because, you know, you, you get to explore uh, and have some fun with the tracks too. So you feel like you've got more invested in the track yourself too because, you know, you put your own stamp on it. So um, Dave too, as well, Dave Colum, you know, he came up with all sorts of little guitar ideas and riffs guitar riff things there's there's on one track he's got this fantastic echo guitar part going on that you know and it sounds amazing it just lifts the track up to another level entirely um Mm. so however you know the chords obviously you've got to kind of go with with the chords etc but but it's a combination of certain things that are written out it was obvious when the riffs you needed to be followed and then those moments where you can kind of stretch out and come up with your own ideas you know, we had free reign to do really what we felt, particularly as well with the drums. I think Rick was really keen for Ash to just be as inventive as he could be. So he would send the tracks to Ash. And I think by and large, he just said, just play what you think. And so Ash then <laughs> came up with the most extraordinary parts and some of this stuff. Which then I get it and I think, oh man, this is amazing. You know, I've got to, I'm going to follow <laughs> Ash on that bit and I'm going to follow <laughs> Rick on that bit and then I'm going to do my own thing on that. Bit. So it's, you know, it sounds like absolute chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, you know, you kind of, it, it, when, you know, you get a good bunch of players and they're all um, creative. Uh, with good ideas and it, it, you know you, hopefully other people sort of will, will agree but I think it's come out great I really do the last time that you were here on the YMP you said that yeah. you heard some of the now shelved ARW music now do you know yeah. if any of that material made its way onto this record no I think um, I, it's, uh, sorry as in uh, no I don't think any of that music uh, has made it onto the record I think Rick would want to leave that uh, for, for the project of ARW because you know who knows what 
could happen in the future, whether they will sort of do something else. I, I don't know the answer to whether they will, but but Rick would definitely want to be writing something completely new and because, you, you know, you can muddy the waters and then suddenly you've got to maybe then talk to the other guys and say, look, you know, well, I wrote this bit, can I sort of have... <laughs> so, so Rick yeah. would rather just kind of go, right, I'm doing a new album, this is a new project, here's some new music. Mm, mm. Um, and then that music is still there for ARW if they ever got back together and sort of decide to do something. There's still, you know, a starting of a project that's already there. Mm. So it, 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 uh, the Red Planet is all, is all new stuff. Yeah. And just... Last thing on ARW, how do you feel personally about the seeming discontinuation of, of ARW? Well, you know, I think um, I have to say I had an absolute ball when I was doing it. I loved every second of it. Yeah. I think it's it's tricky because you've got two guys that live uh, in America and one guy that lives in the UK. Uh, and then if you include me and Lou, so you've got three guys in America and two guys in the UK. And so, you know, getting something like that together isn't always as easy uh, as it could be. Trevor Ray being, of course, you know, he's just one of the most... successful writers of film music in America so he's always got other things going when I spoke to Trevor last which was sometime sort of late last year um, I've had a, a few emails from him but he was conducting um, his own music I think it was at the Hollywood Bowl with the um, <laughs> LA Philharmonic yeah. now you know this guy it's not like he's sitting around no. <laughs> sort of waiting oh I wish something would happen with ARW you know the guys he's, the, he's just he is absolutely just so in to you know music and writing and conducting and all all things as is rick as is john so it's hard to always get three people five people in a room at the same time mm -hmm. i think we did really well for the yeah. two two years that we did uh, so uh, i feel uh, what i feel about it is just i feel really happy and privileged to have stood on a stage with those guys mm. and stood playing the lines of you know my absolute favorite bass player um you know so i feel delighted by it all whether it will happen in the future i don't know but if it does and they ask me i will absolutely i'll be i'll be running <laughs> running into that rehearsal room saying yep yeah, where do i plug in absolutely, awesome yeah. <laughs> with, with, yeah. with, with that said about the future now that rick has returned to a more progressive style at least for now uh yeah. do you think that there's a chance that the next album will continue down this path but maybe with some vocals um it's possible i mean you know again because rick has so many um different irons in the fire in terms of the music that he that he likes and also projects that he's getting on with uh, it's it's hard to kind of say what he's going to come up with next mm. it, it, because he does have so many interest in other areas i mean he may have enjoyed this so much much that he might think mm. i'm going to do another one uh, you know uh, or he might think to himself okay so instrumental was great but i've written all these songs i want to get these down so i've no idea what rick will do in terms of another album next but i mean he may because he's had incredible success with these piano albums yes. piano, um mm. you know really has so he may then think to himself oh great well uh, that's kind of scratched that particular prog itch for the next <laughs> couple of years so yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back to piano and mm. uh because because when he does those solo piano shows he can just be by himself with a piano um mm. and it's it's very easy for him to uh to, to go and do that yeah so i just you know what you can never second guess rick he's no. always got mm. like a new a new idea that he's uh uh you know got on a boiler somewhere so yes. uh, yeah. so yeah I've, i don't know i don't know i hope he does another prog album though because i want to play on it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> But um, speaking about the future for you, though, just before we, we close. There's um, a future for me. Oh, oh great. I'm, I'm sure there must be. There must be. Uh, <laughs> there's, no, there's no future for live music at the moment. But, no, yeah, there isn't. Hopefully that will change toward the end of the year. Yeah, well, that was what I was going to ask you. Is, is this Rick Wakeman album one that could be done live? And would you like to do it live? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, there were plans potentially for in fact we had some shows lined up um around end of march april and may which were not going to be red planet shows but they were kind of going to be prog shows so he's, he's kind of progressive six wives etc 
but also with a view to then taking Red Planet out and touring it as well. And he's already had a few offers sort of come in. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's perfectly doable. A four-piece band, we can all play those instruments. I mean, you know, it, Rick might add another keyboard player. He may as mm. well add his son Adam or someone oh, yeah. um, to sort They're of come, great. which I'd love because Adam's a great mate of mine, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think the plan was to, at some point, do some shows, which well, I oh, would yeah. have loved. And I know Dave Calhoun would have loved and Ash was up for it too. Um, mm. So I think, you know, um, yeah, at some point when things start to get back to normal, there'll be, I think there'll be some shows with Rick. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's great to have you back on the show and I do look forward to you coming back again, perhaps when we've had a chance to listen to the whole of the, the album yeah. and it would be fantastic to speak to, to Rick about it as well. Let's see if we can make that happen. But for now, thank you very much indeed, Lee. Chaps, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's always good to speak to you both and uh, I hope you take care and, you know, stay safe, stay well. Mm-hmm.